be a vegetarian, don't eat meat, you can eat nothing but meat, you can run 40 miles a day. When that time comes, you're going to leave here. Yes. Amen. Regardless of what goes on, God has a bound for every man. He has a date set for us. Amen. And that's one appointment we ain't going to talk our way out of. Guarantee you that. When that time comes, we're going to have to meet that appointment. But the thing about it is, let's try to be ready. Amen. Amen. We know it's coming. Let's try to be ready. And one thing about when uh, someone, uh, God takes someone, it's, it's, uh, it's always hard as a leader because you always ask God why. That question is always in the back of your mind. And I've always heard people say, never ask God why. And I ain't never read that in the Bible. I ain't never seen no half of scripture in the Bible that says, don't ask God why. But I will say this, whenever God put a period, you don't need to put a question mark. Amen. If God put a period there, don't put a question mark, you accept the period and just go on. Amen, because you can't change it. Wherever God puts a period, that's the end of that story. For now. Okay, it'll pick back up later, but that's the end of that story for now. Let's go today to the book of St. Matthew, the 17th chapter. And I'm going to begin reading that 14 verse. We're going to talk about a young man today that had a problem. And his father really wanted him to get some help with this problem. And his father went about it the wrong way to get him some help, but his father wanted his son to be made whole. Now, anybody in here ever had an issue that you was dealing with or someone in your family was dealing with and you wanted them to be made whole? You wanted them to overcome that issue, overcome that problem. You wanted it, you could taste it. You really wanted them to overcome that problem. And whenever you find yourself in situations like that, you have to find yourself in a constant relationship with God. You have to pray to God. Okay? You can't rely solely. I, I was talking to a guy on this week right here, and he was telling me that his uh, son, his, his son had some issues, kind of like this young man in this passage we're about to read about. And his son, I was talking to the boy before the man came up and the boy told me, he said, I hate psychiatrists. He said, I hate to go to them. I hate it. He said, I, he said, I, I, I can't stand to go to the psychiatrist. I, I hate it. And so then the boy went on with playing and his dad was telling me, yeah, he loved to go to the psychiatrist. He loved to. And I said, and I told him, I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. I said, part of the problem is that psychiatrist might be doing more good for you than he doing for that boy. Because the boy don't want to talk to him. It's making your mind feel good that, oh, he's talking to a psychiatrist. But even the boy mind is eating him up. He can't stand it. He don't want to talk to him. He don't like it. He told me, he said, I don't even lay on the couch at the house no more. I said, why? He said, because every time I go to the psychiatrist's office, he want me to lay on the couch. He said, I don't lay on no couches. No way I go. He said, if I see a couch, I sit straight up on it. I would never lay on it. Because every time I go to their, their office, I got to lay on the couch. So what the father think is helping that boy is actually hurting him because he can't stand it. Okay? Sometimes what we think is helping is actually hurting him. But I guarantee you if you turn that situation over to God, he can rectify it better than anybody else can. Yes. Yes. So let's look here at uh, chapter 17, verse 14. It says, And when they will come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for often, for oft times he falleth into the fire and often into the water. Now, first point here, something is definitely wrong with this fellow. Anytime you fall in the fire, something wrong. You know, when I was a child, I burnt myself with an iron. I burnt my, my face, all, most, most of all the skin on my face, I burnt it off. My hands, I burnt it off, and I, the, the, the iron fell on me, and it, you know how it 
uh, shrivels up the skin and I wiped it. So when I wiped it, I wiped all the skin off my face, my eyebrows off. I, I, I burnt myself real, real bad with the, with the iron when I was a kid. Now, right now to this day, if I see an iron on the iron board and children around, I need to make sure it's all for unplugged. Yes. To this day, 40 some years later, I still got in my mind that iron is hot. Okay? That see certain things, pain teaches you certain things. Certain pain you don't ever want to experience again. And so you make sure you do what it takes not to experience that. But if you read this passage here, this little boy often fell into fire. So what that means is he fell into fire, he got burned, and he didn't learn from the mistake. He will fall into fire again. Now, and the, the daddy called him a lunatic. Now, I ain't calling nobody a lunatic today, but I want to ask y'all a question. How many times you've done something more than once and it hurt you? Okay? How many times have you done something and it hurt you the first time and you did it again and it hurt you the second time and you did it again? Okay? This boy, this, his daddy called him a lunatic. He said, my son is a lunatic. Now, let's explain this word lunatic here from the Bible standpoint. He wasn't, nowadays if I say, man, Ryan a lunatic, it's a different saying than what this man he was saying by his son. In the Bible days, they thought certain times of the month made them people act loonier. You know, in the, if, if any of y'all ever went down in that building on Bull Street, the old uh, psychiatric ward down there on Bull Street, let me tell you something. I had to do some AC work in that one time. That is the most eeriest building. Between that building and that building over there on Farrow Road, the old TV camp, those are the two most eeriest feeling buildings I've ever been in in my life. That building down there on Bull Street, it is said, and I don't know how true this is, but it is said that the way that building is designed, no window in that building can you look out of and see the moon. Now, I don't know how they would have built the building because how would they know where the moon would be at? But what they thought was when people who had mental illness certain times of the month saw the moon, it made them flip. That's why this man here was calling his son a lunatic, loony. Okay, they thought that it had something to do with the moon, would make people act out. Okay, so this man wasn't really calling his son a name. He was actually describing a condition. My son is a lunatic, is what he said. And I brought him, now this right here where this man right here needs a, a, a good kick in his rear end for making this statement here. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cast him out. Isn't it funny how people can be hurt, need help, and find somebody to blame for their problems? This man, your son messed up. Your son is the the lunatic, according to what you just said, and instead of you saying, Lord, help me, Lord, I, you blaming the disciples for not being able to cast the devil out. Well, I mean, what? what? It's yours, it's your, how you know this boy ain't inherited this from you? You ever thought about that? Every issue, and let me tell you something, sometimes it's funny. I was talking, I was, me and, uh, Amanda was talking one night and she was talking about something and she was talking about one of our daughters and she said, now she get that from you. That is you. That, that, that's you. That, that's you. And I, I, I didn't want to hear that so I, I just, you know, I, I talk off on something else but I had to laugh to myself. I said, you know what? She absolutely right. Yes. Some of the problems our kids have, they get it from us. My mama used to say, you can't beat you out of them children. You can't beat you out of them. You can whoop them all you want to. You can't beat you out of them unless you cut them over and pour new blood in them. That's the only way you can get some of the stuff out of some people. It's in them, okay? They inherit it. Okay, God is the only thing that can clean up our community. Okay, our DNA can be, okay, how messed up it is. What's in our family background? God can straighten it out. Okay? So this man here, and I, I, I don't understand why he was hurting, needed help, and found somebody to blame for his shortcoming. 
It's amazing how we do that as humans. We will find somebody to blame for our mess. Well, if they, if they hadn't done this, I would have did this. If they hadn't, why sometimes we can't just say it's me? I made this mistake. I made this big and hard. I, I did this. So this man said, I took him to your disciples. And your disciples, I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Now, the boy did have a devil in him. He did, because Jesus rebuked him. Jesus rebuked the devil, and the devil left out of the little boy. Or the grown, I did, don't, we don't know how old this child was, but we know that he was often falling in fire, and wasn't learning from it. Often falling in water and wasn't learning. Probably about to drown. They had to get him out of the water. He just wasn't learning from any of his mistakes. So I asked myself when I was looking at this lesson, as I asked y'all already, how many times if you told an average person they're a lunatic, they'll get mad at you? And then if you ask them, how many times have you done something more than once and it hurt you, they have to stop and think, well, I've done it a couple times. That's the only reason why this boy was called a lunatic, because he did something over and over and didn't learn from the mistake. Okay? Sometimes we do things over and over and don't learn from the mistake. Okay? If you, if a little child touch a, put their hand on a hot stove, it really, they all, they only got to do that about one time. They can be a little child, they'll look at that stove and say, ah! They can barely talk, they can say, ah! They know that stove is hot because they don't touch it and it is burnt. Yes. Okay? That's how you know when whenever uh, it's certain things when a child, uh, when a child is small, and as a child starts to develop, parents look for certain things. You know when your child is real small, they sleep all the time. That's just what babies do. And then they get to that age where you tickle them and you look to see if they smile, if they laugh. You know, I remember a guy was telling me uh, when my child, I think it was Zion, when she was a baby, he was at, uh, we was talking one day, and he was telling me his, and they was around the same age, and he was, he, and I had noticed he would always ask me questions about what Zion is doing. Like he'll say, is she lifting her head up yet? Or do she laugh? Do she do, you know, he would always ask questions. And he, one day he told, told me, he said, he said, yeah, my, my baby don't laugh. He said, my baby, I can't, I can't make her smile. I can't make her, she won't laugh. She, and what I figured out was, he was trying to compare to see what Zion was doing to what his baby was doing. He was trying to see, is she normal? And, and long story short, the, the child ended up having autism, but he was trying to, in his mind, make it make sense why he's not smiling yet, why he's not laughing yet, why he's not, you know, you look for certain mile marks in life. Okay? We as Christians should look for certain mile marks. We should grow past certain things. Okay? We should grow. This is a growing. I'm telling y'all, Christianity and being a Christian is not something you just profess and you stay in that place the next 40 years. It don't work like that. You're supposed to grow. You are supposed to grow and get. Now, I'm not saying you're supposed to be this overnight changed person that make a complete 180. Now, that's not what I'm saying because it takes time. Yeah. It's a growing process. But now, you can't be 60 years old spiritually and be 4 years old. Be 60 years old fleshly and 4 years old spiritually. You have to start growing. You have to. If, if every little small thing aggravates you, you're not growing. Okay? You have to get to the point where you can say, you know what, man, whatever. You know, you just, my mom used to say, used to have a saying, she used to say, you can burn me for a fool, but you won't get no ashes. <laughs> and it took me a long time to figure out what she meant by that. For years, I used to hear her say that. I said, what does that mean? What, what, what does that mean? So finally, I realized what she's really saying is, you can burn me, but I ain't no fool. That's why you ain't get no ashes. Okay, I done grew past that whatever you're trying to burn me on. 
We have to grow every day, every year, every month. We should grow. Yeah. Yeah. We should grow. Now, my growth might not be as fast as Ryan wanted to be. Ryan growth might not be as fast as what I think Ryan growth should be. I should say, well, Ryan should be able to be over there. I can't say that. Because I can't judge how fast he grows. Okay, God is the one that helps him grow. And he's on track in God's calendar. Amen. Okay? He may be on, not be on track in my calendar, but my calendar don't matter. He's on track in God's calendar. Okay? But long as you are growing today, you're moving in the right direction. Amen. Okay? If you whenever you get to the place where you stop growing, we got problems. Okay? Now, as I said on Bible study Wednesday night, if you are five months old, Six months old, a year, and you want milk, that's that's good. If you are 25 and you don't want to eat no food, all you want is somebody to give you a bottle with milk in it, that's a problem. Isn't that a problem? Yeah. We would all be like, man, everybody come in here, we're about to eat. Brenda warming up Ryan's bottle. I would be like, what in the world? I would be like, listen, I can't even watch you give Ryan a bottle. I, I can't even witness this. I don't even want to see you give Ryan a bottle. Wouldn't that be something? Everybody and everybody here just sit around, but don't say nothing. She got to feed her baby. We would be like, I would be like, Brenda, please, okay? Please give Ryan some real food. Sometimes spiritually, that's how we are. Sometimes spiritually, we're drinking milk when we should be eating some collard greens. We should be eating some cornbread. We should be eating some rice. We should be eating some stuff that's, that, that gives us a little more substance, but we're still on milk. Okay? Yeah. And milk, believe it or not, is only for babies. Milk is really not for grown people. Milk is for babies. Okay? Milk is for babies. And milk, what, what, what did you say, friend? Don't milk right your teeth out? Yeah. Milk is for babies, okay? It's not for grown people to always drink milk. Even the Bible, Paul even said in the scripture, he said, he that uses milk is unskillful in the word of God. Other words, what he's saying is that if all I can get up here and preach to you is love your neighbor, love your neighbor, love your, at some point, I need to be able to preach some stuff that's more deeper than just love your neighbor. Because we should be able to have grown past the point of knowing we should love one another. That's it. We should grow past that. All right, next verse. <coughs> then came the disciples to Jesus <coughs> apart and said, why could not we cast him out? Now, these disciples had feelings was hurt. Have you ever been in leadership or you ever been in a position of leadership and someone is railing on you because you couldn't do something that you probably should have been able to do, but your skill level wasn't at that point to do it yet. That's what happened here. Now, they were supposed to be able to cast them out. They, Jesus had not gave them power to cast out the devils, but they couldn't do nothing with this devil right here. And so they came to Jesus afterwards and said, Lord, why couldn't we do it? They feel, they feel this was hurt. Everybody wants to be used by God. I don't care. The average person wants to be used by God. And what hurts you sometimes is people say, well, why? Well, if so-and-so was here, when they prayed, when Pastor so-and-so was here, he prayed, the Lord do it right then. Y'all got that young pastor down there, and he prayed, the Lord don't do nothing. That other pastor come down here, the Lord, the Lord don't do nothing for Pastor Hadley. He, he said, but when, oh yeah, when that other pastor was here, he prayed, and the Lord moved right then. How do you think that would make the pastor feel? No. How, how would you, you, you see what I'm saying? That would make, now even though he might not even be thinking, he might be going home and saying to himself, I know I'm called by God. Amen. Whether you see the hand of God or not, the pastor got to know he's called by God. But Amen. this scripture right here proves to you that people can say things that will hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm. They hurt this, this, this man right here. They, they, that man's words hurt the disciples. He said, they, they said, Lord, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we cast out this devil? Let's see what Jesus is going to say. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily, I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, 
ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth out by <coughs> goeth out, goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This kind of devil you got to pray and you got to fast to get enough strength to rebuke. Some devils you need more strength than others, okay? Some devils, some demons you have to fight, you need more strength than others, okay? Now this, this young man here, these young men, when they went to Jesus and asked Jesus this, Jesus told them basically, because y'all had doubt, y'all couldn't cast this devil out. We can't doubt. We have to always believe God, even when the situation looks bad, still believe God. Okay, when the doctor has given you that bad report, do what? <coughs> Believe God. Amen. Okay, when the job has said, okay, this is it, we'll, we'll give you two more months to work here, and this is it. Believe God. God knows your needs. Okay? These men could not complete this mission here because they doubted God. So I, I want to ask you today, how many times have we failed? Frank, how many times have you failed because you doubted God? Numerous. How many times have I failed because I doubt God? Numerous. Probably can't even count the number of times God was sitting there waiting to do it for me. And my unbelief caused it not to be done. Okay? That's why I tell you, never ever doubt. Always believe that you can do it. Amen. You, do you realize if you believe that you can beat a person, you know it's hard for that person to beat you? I'm telling you, one of our I always like to look at the YouTube documentaries on Muhammad Ali. I think Ali was one of the, the a lot of people don't like him because he talks so much. But Ali made himself believe that there wasn't a human being on this earth that could beat him. He made himself believe that now. It didn't matter that you didn't believe it. He made himself believe that there's not a man breathing can beat him. Okay? And because of that belief, it was hard to beat him. I was looking at his document the other night. He said that when he fought George Foreman, that George Foreman punched the, the bag, the punching bag, so hard. And if any of you ever punched a punching bag, you know a punching bag is hard. He hit the punching bag so hard, he would leave a dent in it this big. Wow. And Muhammad Ali said every time he would walk past the training room, he would never ever look at George Foreman's punching bag because he didn't want to see the dent in the bag because he said it would have messed with him mentally and he wouldn't have been able to fight as good as he could if he had seen that dent because he would have thought, man, he's going to put a dent like that in me. So he said he would, he said he would walk past the room and turn his head, would never look at it, wouldn't even look at it. And he said he would always, and he had a little, a little uh, puppy, puppy, that was a dog, George Foreman puppet. And he said at night, before that fight, he would hold that puppet in his hand and just punch it. And watch the puppet head rock back and forth. And he said when he would hit it, he would say to himself, George, I'm going to beat you. George, I'm And he said he did that for three weeks, and he made himself believe, when I get in the rain, I'm going to beat him just like I beat this puppet. And the reason he shocked the whole world was because George Foreman was stronger, younger. It was impossible, according to everybody, that Muhammad Ali was going to win that fight. But he knocked George Foreman out. And it was so bad that after he knocked George Foreman out, it took George Foreman 20 years to fight again. And that's something to think about. That man beat him in 20 years. He went in depression and couldn't fight because of Muhammad Ali beat him. Okay? Now, I say all that to say, if you believe in yourself, it is hard to lose in anything. Business, church, whatever it is, it is hard to lose if we believe in ourselves. If you doubt yourself, you are already defeated. Okay? You ne never doubt yourself. Never think that you can't accomplish certain things because you can. But if you believe that you can, don't even put up your fist because you've already lost. Okay? Next verse here. How be it? This kind goeth out. Not goeth out, but by prayer and fasting. And while they are in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of 
man shall be betrayed into the, hand of, into the hands of men. They shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorrow. These disciples here was, was a group of men that really, really, really loved Jesus. Okay? It was one in that group that was, a, was, was, was doing things and saying things that he shouldn't, and that was Judas. Before Judas betrayed J Jesus, Judas was already sneaky. Do y'all realize that? When, Ju when the woman came to Jesus with an alabaster box of precious ointment, what was the first thing Judas said? Oh, this could have been sold for X amount of money. See, his mind was already on money. Already. And that's why I tell people, if Jesus picked out 12 people and one of them was a devil, what in the world make Frank think that he's going to pick out somebody that's always right? Impossible, right? What? How can I pick out somebody that's always right if Jesus, the Son of God, picked out 12 of them and one of them turned on him? Okay? You're not going to always get it right. But you, all you can do is work with what you have. So all you can do is work with what you have. Now, these men here, feelings was hurt because they couldn't cast out that devil. Now, how many of you, and I, I remember one time I was a little, I'm still young, but I was younger at this point. And I was, I was, uh, I had just started pastoring. And I was, it was a lady in the church, she was sick. And she came, I was standing, it was after service, and I was standing in front of the pulpit, and I was shaking there in one hand, and uh, uh, some older preachers was right there with me, and, and she was a, a member of, of my church, but there were some older preachers there that day, and she came and she walked right past me, and walked right to the other preachers, and said, I, I need you to pray for me. I, 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 don't, I don't need, she, you know, she looked, I was right there, she said, I, I don't need, you know, anybody to be practicing about prayer. I, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for me that the Lord will work that thing out. And I'm telling y'all, I felt this big. I left church that day feeling like this. Not because I doubted who I was. It just, it. I was floored to know you could serve and give all your time and effort and this person would come and say something like that right in front of me. That day, and, I, and I never forget one of the we left that night, and it was a, about a week later, one of the older preachers that was there that day called me, and he told me, he said, uh, and you got to know him, know, he, he's a fellow that really, he's very, not a controversial person at all. But I remember him, him telling me, he said, you know, when I was a young preacher, he said, people used to walk right past me and go right to Bishop Johnson and tell Bishop Johnson to pray for him, them. They didn't want me to pray for him. He said, but you know, I didn't let it bother me. He said, but I live enough to, he said, now I got more people to pray for than I want to pray for. <laughs> he said, I have people calling me night and day now for prayer. He said, I, I got more people to pray for now than I want to pray for. And I was, I knew why he was telling me that. And then after he told me that, he said, I say all that to say, that situation that happened last week with sister so-and-so did, he said, I, I, I know that bothered you. He said, but don't worry about it. He said, just mark my words. He said, in a little bit, it'll be enough people calling you for prayer. You'll want help. He said, you'll want them to go call somebody else. And, I, and when he told me that, that thing made me feel better. I said to myself, you know what? I ain't the only one who not experienced that. But I was just floored. And, and when I read this other night, I said, I know how the disciples felt. They went to Jesus and said, Lord, why we couldn't do that? We done been wrestling and praying with this boy, and you come and rebuke the devil, and the devil gone, and we sit here and can't do nothing. <laughs> and you've given us power over Satan, but we could not do nothing with this devil. And God let them know y'all have to pray and fast. Now, how many of you in here fast during the run of the week? How, how many people put their plate down and say, I'm going to turn my plate down and I'm going to pray and fast today for more strength and power. Now, I'm telling y'all, just like a boxer has to work out at the gym, saints need to fast in order to have strength. Okay? You can't, listen, if you got somebody in your house, if Ryan come to my house and stay at my house and I don't ask him, Ryan, you got to leave, you got to go back to Bridget and, and Jacob. 
He said, no, I'm going to stay here. All we got to do is stop feeding Ryan. <laughs> I guarantee you, Ryan leaving and going home, right? If you got something in your life that you can't overcome, turn your plate down, stop eating, humble yourself down, and pray before God and see what it moves. Yeah. Prayer will get fast and causes things to move out of your life. Sometimes you got to turn your plate down. Now, old folks used to fast all the time. All the time. They would fast, 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 fast. Just, you know, they would, they would fast. But, see, things were different in the 50s and the 60s than it is now. We get sick now. I got insurance card in my wallet. I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to throw my insurance card on there. Whatever it is, they will give me a prescription. Then I got another card where my prescription might be $2. I didn't pay much or nothing. Back in the 50s and 60s, they didn't have that luxury. Okay? They didn't have that luxury. So when they was really sick, they had to go to God, and they had no one to depend on but God. And if God didn't come to them and send out a lot of them, a lot of them died. Okay? I, I, I don't know as a an older house in Camden, over off of Toonfield Road. It's a big, nice, pretty house. And it used to be an old doctor in Camden. And it was at the time where if you were African American, you couldn't go to the hospital. So what this doctor would do, he had is another little building off from his house. He never would refuse an older, he was an older man then, that's from what I was told. An older white guy that he never refused anybody who came to him. So, those African Americans didn't have money to go to the doctor. So what they would do is go to his house and he would, whatever, if he could help you, everybody in the African American community know if you could get to that doctor's house, he was going to help you. And, and his payment was anything that you had. A chicken. Uh, 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 whatever you had, you brought it to him and that's what he took and he would help you. God always got somebody to help you. Now think about that. That might seem like much of nothing then nowadays, but think about it. If you was really needed help in those days and you had Clinton go to the doctor, to the hospital, and you got this man here, all you got to do is give him three chickens. He obviously, he didn't need the chickens. He was just, he was doing a, a favor or doing a service to help these people who was less fortunate and couldn't get help nowhere else. God used him to help them. Yeah. And that's something to think about. A lot of times we always think of it as, as the opposite. Oh, if you don't have, didn't have this money, then none of these folks was going to help. That's not true. Do you know people are people with good hearts no matter what color they are? Yes. Yeah. You got black folks with good hearts. You got white folks with good hearts. You got black folks that won't help you if your tongue drag in the ground, they ain't going to help you. You got white folks won't help you if your tongue drag in the ground and step on it and keep going. You have people who won't do right in every nationality under the sun. Okay? It's not a black thing or a white thing. Okay? And God has certain people who he's touched their heart and they'll help you. Yeah. Thank God for that man. When every time I ride past that house, I say to myself, somebody could have been any matter of fact, it was some of my brothers. I've known people that said they went to that guy. Some people in that same little building off from his house had nowhere else to go, but that man would take his time and offer them medical services basically free of charge because he had a good heart. So don't tell me that this group won't help me or that group won't help me. God has somebody to help every one of us in here. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. It doesn't matter what, who you are, what your color is. If you're a child of God, God will touch somebody's heart in their heart. And it took God way back in the 40s to touch that man's heart. He didn't have to do that. That man didn't have to do that. What? What? Uh, a, fellow, a fellow with a big old home and a nice uh, uh, farm like that need four chickens. What did he need four chickens? He don't need that. He was just doing a service to help. God put that in that man's heart and he couldn't turn anybody down. Regardless of who you was, what your economic status was, God put it in his heart to help. Just like these disciples here, it was in their heart to help. 
but they didn't have the means to help. Okay? Sometimes you can want to help, but you don't have the ability to help. These men wanted to help that young man get that devil out of him, but they didn't have the means to help him. They weren't strong enough. And ask yourself today, how many times have you faced the devil that you weren't strong enough to be? Y'all ever faced the devil that you just couldn't whoop? I have. I faced, I faced the devil, I just couldn't beat him. Couldn't beat him. And sometimes you can't do it on your own. That's what prayer and fasting come into play. Yes. Okay? And I'm telling y'all, you may not believe this, but the spiritual world is real. Yes. Yeah. It's not a joke, okay? I know people don't believe that, but the spiritual world is for real. Okay? There are certain things, as I tell people, certain stuff don't play with. Like those Ouija boards and all that stuff. Don't even play with that stuff. Why would you play with those type of spirits? Because you don't know what's going to happen. Okay? Don't play with that type of stuff. <laughs> now, one thing about a child of God. A child of God don't have to worry about these evil spirits overtaking them if they stick with God. Amen. That's right. Okay? They don't have to worry about these evil spirits overtaking them if they stick with God. That's why I don't worry about roots and stuff. Like I told y'all before, the lady said she was going to put some roots on me and put... Um, she was going to curse my money. So she was going to put a $20 bill on my porch, wrapped up in about 15 different ways. I told her, I wish you would. I'm going to take it and go buy ice cream with it. <laughs> I ain't even talking about no roots. The root ain't never root can do nothing to God's children. Amen. No, the only time a root can buy, if you sit there and fool with these people, they'll tell you, I'm going to put roots on you, you'll be walking around your house scared. You'll be walking around your house scared. I was told, uh, a man told me <laughs> the other, a couple weeks ago that I was laughing about this. He said way back in the 60s, some people came to our church and uh, there was two ladies and they said that they was, they was coming to work roots on my granddaddy. And so what they did was in the church, the, the, the restrooms was like behind the pulpit. So you had to go through a side door and you went back behind the pulpit and the restrooms back there. So they dropped some roots Whatever the little thing was, they dropped it on their way down around the pool pit because they said they were going to work roots on them. And however they say he knew, I don't know if he saw him do it or whatever. They said he said, the Lord told me y'all came to say y'all was going to work roots on me. So they said he picked up the little thing off the floor, the little twig the lady dropped and chewed it. <laughs> so he put it in his mouth and chewed it up. So he chewed it up and spit it out and said, now that's how much I think about the power in them roots you got. See, if you don't, if you stay there and worry about people, people will have you scared, shaking in your boots by roots. They have you so scared to do anything. You hear me? How the world are you gonna curse my money when God said, if I pay my tithes and offering, I'm already blessed. Yes. But you gonna curse me because you mad at me. So you gonna fold up a twenty dollar bill? I wish you had to fold up a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> that would give me more to spend. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to fall up a $20 bill and put it on my porch. I'm telling y'all, fans, if you fool with people, people have some of the weirdest things they'll do and call themselves cursing you. But you can't curse God's people. No, can't. Amen. can't curse God's people. There was a Mercedes we were going to close. There was a man in the Bible, I think it was Abimelech, who he told him to go curse God's people. Mm -hmm. And he said, I can't curse them because they are blessed. Hey, that's how the man told him, he said, man, I'll pay you. I'll give you whatever you want. How much gold you want? Just go out there and curse the children of Israel. And the prophet told him, he said, I can't do it. He said, I cannot curse those people because they're blessed. So if you are blessed in here today, that situation, that devil thinking that he's going to control that child and control that situation in your life, just put prayer and fast. That's all. Get you some oil. Get you some some some. 100% pure olive oil, prayer oil. Get you some oil, and at night, rub it on that child. Rub it on them and pray. I remember when I was a child, and I don't know if this is good or bad, y'all, but listen, when I was a child, I don't care what sickness you had, this was your medicine right here. I, my mama lived by prayer oil. Oh, mama, I done broke my arm. Rub it with some prayer oil. 
Oh, my, my head and ass falling off. We took some prayer oil. Everything was prayer oil, and I'm telling you, we lived. Now, I don't know if that was just because of her faith or our faith, but everything was prayer oil. And what we would do if we had a cold, she would say, go get my prayer oil. She will put some prayer oil on it, and the stuff was so nasty, we didn't want to eat it. She would say, get a little bit of sugar and put it on the spoon, and take that prayer oil, and you'll be all right in the morning. And I'm telling y'all, we wake up in the morning trying to cough so we wouldn't go have to go to school. We feel good. We would have to get up and go to school. I'm telling y'all, I'm tell I don't know. There is power yes. in doing what God says. Yes, yeah. And God says, anoint with oil. Yes, okay, so when you do it the way God said, God's gonna honor it. Amen. He's gonna hold up his end of the bar. And that's why when we pray here, y'all, we always anoint with oil. Now, I know a lot of churches don't do that. They don't anoint with oil, but that's what God said do. He said anoint with oil. Okay? Now, there's no power in the oil. No. The power is in God. Yes. Okay? I, I think uh, we had a lesson here. I can't remember who taught it. It might, it might have was Frank or I was on our Bible study. Maybe I taught it. I can't remember. But uh, what we were saying was the children of Israel trusted in the ark more than they trusted in the God of the ark. Yeah. Yeah. Their faith was in that box, but what their faith should have been in, who was back in the box. So our faith is in God, not in the ark. Okay? So whatever situation you need to take before God this week, take before God and put prayer and fasting on it. And I guarantee you God will come through.